uh, Steen Fellows is doing a spine year with us. Um, and I was just talking to him about you know, this section here. And, and these are the questions that I got asked in my oral mock uh, oral board reviews. Uh, and the complexity and caliber will be what you would get in, in the general section, a broad variety of cases um, and uh, dealing with topics that you would generally see if you were a surgeon, neurosurgeon or, or, um, or a general practitioner out in the community at, at a small hospital or at an ED. So without further ado, I'm gonna get started here. You can all see the screen. And once we go through these cases, we'll just review them uh, slowly one by one. And we, we might finish sooner than later, we'll see. Uh, so case one, uh, and uh, you know, when you're doing the oral boards, just take a step back, when you're doing the oral boards, um, the examiner won't say anything, but for the case of, uh, for this or oral presentation, I'll do the talking and present the case, but in most, actually in all, in all examination formats, uh, the examiner will not say a single thing. He'll just put case one up. And for your pacing needs, I thought it would, I think it's very important that you just read out exactly what it, what it says on the slide. I'll do that for uh, Robbie today. But in the actual exam, they, they won't say anything. They'll just put the slide up and wait for you to read it uh, and wait for you to ask for the next slide. So that's exactly how the, the pacing and format goes. In any event, 75 year old female presents to emergency with acute leg weakness and sharp shooting pain down her legs, left, worse than right. Post medical history is that she's got diabetes, which is relatively uh, controlled, um, although her H1C is pretty high. Hypertension, which is not controlled and a prior stroke, uh, which she's recovered from. Okay, um, I think uh, first thing I would want to get some more history. So I'd want to know um, information regarding the chronicity, um, the severity of her uh, symptoms, and then also if she's having any kind of um, neurologic symptoms such as urinary or bladder dysfunction, and then also any weakness. Uh, those are good questions. She's been having problems with urinary continence and she um, has stated that uh, over the last several months, this problem has getting, been getting worse, more acutely in the last day or two, which drove to the emergency room. And specifically, her urinary incontinence is, has, has declined significantly. Okay. Um, and then I would want to know if she's had, um, if she's currently uh, retaining urine would be um, a question for me as well. Um, and Wait. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, and then I, I would also want to know if she's having any kind of numbness or sensory deficits. So she does say that she's she's numb in the legs. Uh, she can barely feel the bottom of her feet. She thought that was due to her diabetes. Um, and she says that, yes, she, in terms of incontinence, uh, she basically can't get, uh, she dribbles, her urine has to wear a, uh, a diaper when she goes to bed. Okay. And then I would also want to know if she has um, sensation in the groin and then if she's able to, you know, feel when she's voiding. Can you, I can hear that over here. I can hear that over here. She, uh, that's right. She um, has, uh, she, she says that she has some numbness in that, in that area as well. Okay. And then last question, um, where exactly is her pain along um, shooting in her leg? Uh, she, you know, she states their pain is like down the side uh, aspect of her leg um, and uh, both sides originating in her back, but just going down the back of her leg, side of her leg. Okay, great. Um, I think with that information, I'd like to proceed with a uh, physical exam. Here's the exam. So she's afebrile. Her blood pressure slightly elevated, as mentioned. Um, upper extremity exam is fine. In the lower extremity, uh, her bilateral iliopsoas, quadriceps, and hamstrings are two out of five. Below that, uh, her anterior tibialis gastroc and EHL is zero out of five. And your sensation, sensation exam is confirmed with decreased pinprick, and your reflexes are absent. Okay. Does she have any um, signs of hyperreflexia or spasticity or maybe a Babinski or clonus? No clonus, no Babinski, just no reflexes in the lower extremity. Okay, and then um, a rectal exam, digital rectal exam. Excellent question. 
uh, and no uh, uh, minimal to no tonal rectal exam. Okay. Um, yeah, so with these findings, I think, um, you know, I'd establish a differential diagnosis here. And my differential diagnosis, number one, would be some kind of um, com compressive etiology, um, you know, in, in the nerve roots. So I'd be highly concerned for cauda equina uh, here. So I think I'd like to proceed with a um, both a CT of the lumbar spine and, a, and an MRI. Uh, you're in a small hospital to get an x-ray first. Um, okay. Uh, and this is what they see. Okay. Um, looking at this x-ray, um, the AP and the lateral lumbar x-ray films, I don't see any um, demonstrable osseous abnormality. So I think, um, you know, I'd like to get an MRI. Uh, and this is your MRI scan. Okay. Uh, this... And sorry, uh, one other question that I forgot to ask is you said her um, sensory deficit, does she have a sensory level at all or is it really just in the, uh, the legs or the feet? Just the legs, there's no, there's no really, you know, basically anything in the legs is kind of decrease in my, and, and, and kind, of, kind of like, uh, she can't really describe it from very accuracy into dermatomal level if that's, your, if that's what you're asking, but. Okay, like, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, she didn't have any signs of, um, you know, something coming, compression from higher up. So here it looks like um, she has uh, severe lumbar stenosis at L4-5 caused by uh, both the disc protrusion as well as um, ligamentous hy hypertrophy posteriorly. Looks like, um, you know, very similar to what she was saying. This is a chronic condition that likely developed over um, several months and years. Um, I would, I would recommend, um, you know, for her, I, I would recommend, uh, semi-urgent surgery, you know, within the next 48 hours. Okay. Would you use steroids? I would not use steroids. Okay. And, uh, describe the, just briefly describe the positioning and what you would do in surgery. What are you going to book the surgery on the consent for? Okay. Um, so first, um, you know, obviously I, I would explain to the patient that, you know, her condition, she's got severe lumbar stenosis between lumbar four and lumbar five, and that she's going to need surgery. And that the indications for surgery is that she has an acute um, neurologic deficit. And the risks of not doing that is that this deficit um, could progress and it could also be permanent. Um, other risks of surgery also include, um, infection, bleeding, and the need for reoperation. I would tell her that our surgery would be a um, lumbar four or five uh, discectomy and la laminectomy and discectomy. Um, bilateral, I would do a um, midline sparing laminotomies on both sides and then do a discectomy. And I would um, position the patient prone on a um, Wilson frame on a um, flat, flat table um, I would use, I would use neuromonitoring and, um, I think that's, that's about it for okay. case preparation. Sure. Great. Um, during your surgery, uh, you had mentioned one of the risks was shooter spinal fluid leak. Um, and indeed that happens and you notice a tear in the dura. What would you like to do? Um, so after I see a tear in the dura, I want to first assess, you know, where exactly it's coming from, and then make sure that I've, I have visualized basically all of it and that I have adequate exposure of, of the leak and where it's coming from. Once I've confirmed the location of the leak and that, that I'm sure that it's adequately exposed, you know, drilling more bone if I need to, then I would attempt uh, primary closure with 6-0 proline on a BB, BB1 needle. Excellent. During your drilling of, you know, during your drilling as you're trying to expose more dura, um, basically end up finding that your nerve roots get caught up in your drill. And this is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And you clean up the edges. Um, but you end up uh, clean the edges to this. Um, what would you do next? So are there any changes in neuromonitoring? Yep. You basically lost signals in that left um, anterior tibialis gastro. 
Okay. Well, I don't have any experience with um, you know, nerf grafting here. So I would I would elect to um, continue the procedure and basically um, attempt uh, appropriate dural closure, and then um, you know making sure that all the nerve roots are pushed back into the intrathecally, and then um, and then basically you know obtain dural closure and close the case, and then uh, proceed to a post-op exam. Okay. Uh, next case, um, twenty-three-year-old female presents the emergency room with uh, acute, again, very similar uh, presentation, acute leg weakness um, and sharp shing pain down her legs again. Um, very similar to the last patient. Okay, um, similar to the last patient, I, I'd wanna know, you know, chronicity, how long this has been going on, and then also any sensory deficits, any, any weakness and any bowel or bladder dysfunction. She says that she's been having some smile bowel by this function, but you know, she's a medical student and she knows enough to know that uh, she doesn't really have retention, although she has some numbness in her lower extremities. Um, she was, uh, you know, on the neurosurgery service as a sub so she kind of knows what this is, she was, what, what, what problems can arise. And this is relatively acute, happened in the last day or so. Um, okay, and then any weakness? Yeah, she has some um, uh, weakness in her legs. Again, uh, very similar to the last patient, distally very weak, uh, proximally so, uh, stronger, no issues with arm strength or arm weakness. Um, although she does say that her, um, her sensation, uh, she can kind of uh, uh, say that it's, it's decreased significantly in her lower extremities, but she can also notice some decreased sensation in her chest uh, above her nipple line. Um, Perhaps even, perhaps even, uh, you know, maybe in, into her neck, but really, uh, there's a subtle gradient change, unlike the last patient, from her chest down to her legs. Okay, I see. Um, okay, I think I'd like to proceed with a physical exam. Physical exam, uh, relatively healthy from a vital standpoint. Uh, she's got full strength upper extremities, um, like I, like we talked about, decreased uh, strength in her lower extremities. Uh, much weaker as you get distally, um, no reflexes distally. Um, sensation exam, decreased light touch to pinprick and low extremities, but that is also a gradient effect into her chest, as I mentioned. Uh, and she, she notices that it's also significantly affected as you examine her in her, in her, in her thorax. Okay. Any, um, any signs of upper motor neuron? Uh, findings like spasticity, clonus, Babinski, hyperflexia. You, know, you, you notice that she has a slight, um, uh, you know, a, a slight uh, hyper, well, a slight ref reflex issue in upper extremities. Uh, she's got full strength, but she's got two plus um, biceps tendon um, reflexes, but you don't know if that's because she's young or if that's abnormal. Okay. And then I would also like to do digital rectal exam um, given her symptoms. She has um, tone, uh, but decreased sensation um, and she's not retaining urine. She's not retaining urine. Okay. And there's, there's nothing in there. So. Okay. Okay. So our PBRs are, are zero basically. Okay. Then I think uh, I'd like to proceed with some imaging. Uh, I don't know if we're, I, I, I would like to get an MRI of her cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine with and without contrast. Okay. So um, with her um, imaging, uh, you don't see anything on the lumbar spine. And on the cervical, thoracic imaging, uh, this is what you see. This is, you can describe the imaging. This is a T2. This is a T2 axial. And you are, you asked for contrast, and that this yeah. is a contrasted image. Let me know if you okay. want to go can back you, and forth. Yeah, if you mind just going back. Sorry, I cut out there for a second. Sure. sure. This is contrasted, or this is okay. this is a T two. Oh, this is T two. Okay. Okay. Um, looks like we, I see we have a, a sagittal cervical MRI here, and I see what looks to be. 
um, T2 hyperintensity in the cord, um, starting around the cervical thoracic junction. I do see a little bit of spinal cord swelling. Mm -hmm. And um, I also see what looks to be a little bit of artifact right around the cord. I don't see either CSF all around the cord, so I don't see any frank compressive lesion at this point. So it looks to be um, intramedullary in nature. Um, do you mind advancing? Yep, is the axial. Okay. Not too much more on the axial and then the next one. This is the post contrast. Okay, so um, doesn't it doesn't look to be contrast enhancing. Um, so I think my differential for this patient would be broad at this point, especially especially given her age. Um, you know, I would be obviously I'd be concerned for some kind of neoplastic process, but I would also be concerned for an infectious process and also an inflammatory process. I think um, would be behind my differential. So something like MS or also transverse myelitis um, would also be on my differential. What would you like to do next? Um, I'd like to get a um, CSF sample. So I'd like to do a lumbar tap. What, would you, what are you looking for? Um, So I think uh, in terms to diagnose MS, I would want to look for oligoclonal banding and um, besides that, just normal CSF numbers and then cultures. Okay. Next case. Uh, this is a 53-year-old uh, 53 year old male, I should say, who presents the ED with numbness, tingling, pain of his hands, slowly worsening um, uh, over the last couple of months, but yesterday uh, unbearable uh, and right worse than left. Um, his history of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, GERD. He's a big guy, uh, chronic neck and back pain. Uh, used to be a um, Seahawks player, um, but now he's kind of transitioned this, in this big blob of a person. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is what's going on with him. Okay. Um, so this has been going on for about a year. Any bowel or bladder dysfunction? No bowel or bladder dysfunction. Uh, he just has been noticed this, uh, hand issue. Um, and, uh, he just doesn't know what to do about it. Um, okay. he thought it was nothing, but slowly having harder time buttoning, tying his shoelaces. Now he uses Velcros. Okay. Any issues with amb ambulation? Uh, no issues with ambulation other than he's a big guy. Uh, so he's got issues with, you know, his knees moving around, things like that. But he thinks it's just arthritic based. Okay. Okay. And um, is he working? Is he employed? Uh, no, he's a retired football player. He's retired. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. I'd like to proceed to a physical exam. Uh, nothing on physical exam. He's relatively healthy other than uh, he's got some weakness in his thumb, particularly on the right. Uh, you don't notice any other strength issues um, in, his, in his hands. Okay. Any um, Hoffman's, Babinski, Clonus, hyperflexia? Uh, as you're doing your exam, you take a look at his hands and this is what you see. These is, these, ignore these two things. These are just blisters from when he, he still tries to pump iron like a crazy man, but ignore that. Other than that, he's got big sausage-like football player fingers. Okay. Um, you cut out there in the, the first part of the slide. Do you mind just repeating your first couple of sentences? I'm sorry. No, I just said uh, ignore these two blisters. That's from him trying to pump iron uh, because he still thinks oh. he can work out like a madman. Oh, okay. I got you. And um, you said there was or there wasn't hyperflexia? Uh, no, actually decreased uh, reflexes and, uh, you know, nothing abnormal. He's just a big guy. The obesity part makes it hard for you to get, check the reflex of the biceps and triceps. But you don't think there's, okay. a, and there's no pathologic, you know, hyperflexia. 
Okay. And did you say that his his numbness in the in the in the arms and the hands is exactly where? It's just in the hands, and he describes it's, it. It's just in his hands, and he describes it. It's, it's worse on the right than the left. Describes it principally in the thumb, uh, ring finger, and and first uh, or second digit or mid, or index finger. Okay. And is which side is one side is worse than the other? The right side is worse. The right side is worse. Okay. And um, okay. And then on the physical exam, I'd also want to do like a, a tunnel, a tunnels test, and a Phelan's test to assess for carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, you do that, and he's got a positive uh, tunnel sign at the wrist. Uh, not so much on the left, mainly on the right. Uh, and you do a Phelan's, and it's positive uh, on the right as well. Okay. And then, um, so then I'd like to proceed. I still want to rule out some kind of compressive lesion in a cervical spine. So I'd want to get an MRI of a cervical spine. The MRI of the cervical spine, uh, great idea. The MRI of the cervical spine doesn't look impressive at all. It looks relatively normal. Okay. Um, then I'd like to get um, nerve conduction studies and an EMG of the entire upper extremities. You do that and for, you get it on both sides and the neurologist tells you that it's consistent with median nerve uh, neuropathy on the right at the wrist. And, not, and nothing on the left? Nothing on the left. Okay. And so then for him, I'd like to uh, trial uh, a splint okay. for um, three months and see if that improves his symptoms at all. Uh, you trial the you trial the splint. It it works somewhat, um, and uh, but you know he still wants to continue doing stuff with his hands. He also feels like it you know the splint is useful, but it doesn't help his nocturnal pain, uh, arm, a hand pain in the right hand, and he continues to, have to shake it out in the middle of the night. Okay, and. Um... Then in this case, since his, his symptoms seem to be quite, uh, you know, interfering with his daily life and it doesn't seem to be resolving with conservative therapy, then I would assess his interest in, you know, surgical therapy for uh, carpal tunnel decompression. Uh, he wants to proceed with surgery and uh, you set him up for carpal tunnel surgery. Where would you like to make the incision? Uh, I'd like to make top right, top left, bottom right, bottom left, whichever one. Um, I would say, I think uh, top right. Top right, this one. Uh, yes. Next case, um, this is a 93 year old, I think it's the last case. So Ravi, you've been doing really well with the timing. So that's good. Um, and uh, 93 year old male presents to ED with the worst day of their life. Um, his postmodal history is that uh, he's hypertension. He's a prior CEA bilaterally. Uh, he's a veteran of the uh, Burma campaign in World War II and has PTSD from that. Okay. Um, any neurologic deficits that he's reporting? Uh, he's not reporting any issues other than he just woke up uh, with the worst head of his life. Um, and that's what brought him to the emergency room. He's a veteran, strong guy. He doesn't really have pain issues, and this is abnormal. Okay. Then I'd like to do a um, physical exam and you know, neurologic examination with a full cranial nerve exam. It's non-focal. You don't find anything on examination other than an old guy, in a wheel, in a, not in a wheelchair, but just an old guy uh, who's relatively functional, um, lives in a nursing uh, or assisted living, um, but relatively independent. Okay. Then I'd like to get a um, CT had non-contrast, then uh, basic labs, CBC, BNP, coags. Uh, his lab work uh, uh, looks relatively normal. He's slightly hyponatremic, but this is what this, the head CT shows. Okay, and he 
he's never has he been suffering from headaches um recently over the past year or chronically or is this just an acute issue this is an acute issue for him the headaches okay and how severe are the headaches on a scale of one to ten he says it's 10 out of 10. okay um i think i you know what i would counsel for this um can you just for this, of, uh, can you just yeah, sure. Screen. Sorry. Yeah. So what I see here, is we have a non-con head CT, um, axle on the left, coronal on the right, and there's um, a right-sided, um, right hemispheric subdural collection. Um, looks most likely to be an acute, acute on chronic um, subdural hematoma um, with the, just a little bit of an acute component that I can see. Um, so I, I think um, for this gentleman, obviously his age is, you know, quite an issue. Um, he's 93 years old. I'm, I'm very concerned about his, um, you know, his ability to handle general anesthesia. And um, given the fact that, you know, he has a lot of, you know, atrophy and volume loss, and he doesn't seem to be having any focal deficits, um, I would want to assess if I can deal with this um, conservatively. Um, so I'd want to get, uh, so I'd want to observe him for 24 hours, maybe get a repeat head CT in 24 hours. Okay. So, um, o overnight you, you, you admit him to the hospital. Uh, you know, no, I'm sorry, I want to put him in the ICU. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. So you put him in the ICU, uh, overnight the next morning you're doing rounds and you notice that he's beginning to have drift. You repeat the head CT, which essentially looks the same. Okay. Um, so then at this point with the new neurologic deficit and uh, subdural, you know, chronic subdural hematoma, I think um, I would elect to offer him surgery um, in, the, uh, in the form of a um, right-sided, um, uh, I, I would do, I would basically do like a catheter and um, just do like a, a small twist drill and just a catheter and try to get all the hematoma out essentially just to irrigate out all the hematoma would you just do one burr hole or two burr holes or three uh, i would do i would do two burr holes okay uh during your uh burr hole and catheter placement uh you, you are having a hard time uh controlling the uh you get a lot of old blood uh which looks like black and motor oil but then you start seeing bright red new blood and you have a hard time controlling it what would you like to do Um, at this point, if, um, you know, it's been a significant period of time and, and this blood looks arterial and it doesn't seem to be dissipating, then I would like to convert this to a full craniotomy. Okay. Excellent. Um, all right, Ravi, I think you did, that's it. I think you did pretty well. Uh, I think your pacing was great. I think you should have more confidence in yourself, uh, you know, talking through this. Um, you know, okay. uh, I think because you, you, uh, you did fine with most of these cases, I think your pacing was excellent, uh, for four cases in a, in a relatively short period of time. Um, we, I, I'll go through some of just the exam things and then we'll go through some of the focused, uh, particular, uh, issues with each of these cases. Uh, each of these cases are actually the case that you get in the gen, as I mentioned, general sexual neurosurgery boards, um, and very straightforward in terms of like what they expect you to do. Like I mentioned, pacing is important if you're in the exam. They're not going to say anything on the slides. You're going to have to read them. And then you have to ask them the questions. Robbie did an excellent job asking the history uh, questions because not everything will be presented on the slide. And I've, you know, in past, past times we've done this examination, I've been feeding the examinee uh, different piece of information, but Robbie did an excellent job teasing out what you needed to know. The first case, I think the, the important thing that, I, that you need to tease out is the rectal exam. Uh, and the sensation exam, which he did a great job with and in recognizing the pathology. Also, we, what Robbie did excellent today was uh, you know, talking about the differential diagnosis uh, for compressive lesions. I don't think they will probably get too far into it, but this is a classic case of cord equinus syndrome. Don't overthink it. Uh, talk about compressive pathologies. He did a good job with mentioning that he would also look at the C, uh, T and C spine as well and try to make sure that there was no upstream pathology. Uh, you want to mention, you know, what these types of images are on the exam, T1, T2, whatever. Uh, I think what else you, you might have mentioned that there's all this 
cord equina roots clumped up uh, in the spine above in the in the um, canal above the pathologic lesion which is indicative of that the issue with steroids or not steroids we've talked about before and um, you know controversial depending on where you where you sit and where how you are trained but if you're going to choose one or the other you're going to have to have a clear protocol or reason to do so uh, in in this case also um, I think it was important, you know, if you do look at this imaging and it does look off a little bit, you know, the, although this is a classic case of cord equina syndrome, I could have been mean and given him uh, other issues, uh, such as a tumor that's causing compressive issues, um, uh, an eruptured AVM that's causing compressive, compressive issues, uh, but there are other things, uh, neo, you know, neoplastic being the most common that can cause a, neo, uh, a compressive issue, which although you might not see in the general section, you might see in a specific spine section, uh, that will might throw things off. So the cord equina, excellent diagnosis, uh, um, you know, identification. A dural tear is the most common complication that uh, people will see during an exam, and uh, especially in the general section. So managing that, prepared and being prepared to manage that, you should all have this kind of mo memorized like six O proline, you know, uh, fine pickups, uh, you know, uh, fibrin glue or some kind of to seal or seal whatever you have to use, valsalva maneuvers to make sure it's closed, um, drill, like Robbie said, drill more bone um, if you need to have better exposure, um, get the CSF leak or the dural tear repaired. The one complication that I gave him was, you know, a drill, you know, nerve root gets stuck in the drill, which is also um, can, can be seen. Although Robbie mentioned that, you know, he's never seen it, never managed it. Uh, I think that uh, they would expect him when they would push him to do, I didn't push him today, but they would push him to do something. So when you see nerve ends like this, you know, the one thing that they, they may hint at is that you clean up the, you know, severed ed edges and the words they want to specifically hear. Uh, so, you know, Robbie, for you in this case, I wouldn't have, I, they may have given you a hard time for just closing up. Um, but what they want to hear is cable repair. So meaning that just like a, like a fiber optic cable, you're matching fascicles to fascicles and tension free with a uh, tenno suture. So tenno suture, uh, uh, tension free cable repair. Three things they wanna mention. They don't care how you do it. They're not, they're not peripheral nerve experts either, uh, but they just wanna hear those three things that you're gonna to try to put these two ends together in a tension free cable matched um, with tenno suture repair. Um, and pretty much that's all they want to hear, but a complication that can happen that you want to be able to manage. Second case, uh, also excellent management in this case uh, of, this of this patient, 23-year-old uh, female, acute legs, uh, acute weakness down her legs, and the, and the presentation can be exactly the same uh, as the prior case, and don't, don't let that throw you off because sometimes the examiner will do that and have every case have the same exam, although different imaging, so don't let it throw you off. The next slide is the next slide. Dr. Monteith, who's on this call too, will always say that that's the goal of this examination. The next slide is the next slide. Deal with the pacing and what the exam is going to throw at you. Don't worry about the slide before unless, or the case before, just keep moving onto the cases. Uh, in, this, in this particular case, you did, you did a great job by asking for a contrasted imaging. Um, a lot of examiner, examinees would not ask for that when they saw the initial, initial MRI scan. So you uh, kind of uh, hit that one out of the park. Um, and your differential was excellent too in terms of um, non-surgical or non-neoplastic um, non uh, uh, non um, reasons to have this kind of imaging. Uh, things to look at on the T2 images is that there's no defined uh, region is kind of very hazy and diffuse over several segments. That's common for, um, in this case, acute transverse myelitis. Uh, the next thing is age of the patient. And lastly, uh, no, no enhancement on contrast imaging. Um, and so with those three things, operating on this patient would be the wrong thing to do. But the examiner, I wasn't mean about it today, but the examiner might push for a biopsy. You know, keep, well, why do you want to biopsy this, Dr. Nuno? Why don't you want to biopsy it? Um, but you do the right thing and get a CSF sample first. You can get a CSF sample if this was a, uh, if this if this enhanced in the cord, you could still get a CSF sample. So I think in terms of management of these kind of patients, it's always good to look at the CSF. I didn't harass uh, Dr. Nuna too much about what you should look for in the CSF and management, but there are some examiners uh, like my old boss who would ask you 
what you're looking for specifically and what treatment you would do for that. So monoclonal anti antibodies for MS, IgG for acute transverse myelitis, but what treatments, sometimes they do get into the weeds about that, about what you would treat the patient with. You're not a neurologist and it's okay you say you don't, you don't know and then you make a neurology referral, but just for extra brownie points or just to push you to the end of the case, they may ask you what treatment. Uh, and in my case, not only did they ask me about the treatment, got the treatment right, but they asked me what the complications of that medication is, the side effects of that medication is. So um, it can get uh, really in the weeds, but he, you did an excellent job of looking at that differential. Uh, and, they, and if you're gonna go through five cases, especially in the general neurosurgery section, and for you, uh, Ravi, you're going through spine case specifically, they're gonna give you one that's not surgical. So they're gonna give you something that's not gonna be there and you got that pretty well. Uh, this next patient is a classic peripheral nerve case, which again, you'll get in the general section of the boards. And it's, they're not trying to trick you. It's just classic uh, carpal, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, I just wanted to, it's kind of hard in this image, but there's slight thinner atrophy uh, on, this, uh, on this muscular, on, on this thumb here compared to this thumb. So a slight flattening of the fold, a slight flattening of the thinner eminence compared to the normal side. Um, Again, I didn't harass you about the muscle groups, but uh, they may ask you about the physical exam. What do you, how do you do a median nerve exam? I think you touched on it very briefly in terms of knowing the dermatome or the uh, sensory distribution of the median nerve, uh, which is you know classically thumb, index finger, ring finger, in a broad strokes, uh, you know distal to the wrist. So you need to know the sensory di distribution of the median nerve. The other thing you need to know is the muscle groups. And again, I didn't get to these examination findings about that because I didn't want to um, you know, push you too hard. But on a case with peripheral nerve, they will ask you which muscles are involved. So if you say, I think it's carpal tunnel, you want to have cold, like, okay, what muscles am I looking at in the wrist for carpal tunnel? And in this case, it'll be the thumb muscles, which are the opponents, the abductor, uh, brevis, and the flexor brevis um, of the, of the thenar uh, musculature uh, and the lumbricals, the first and second lumbricals. So you want to be, you know, you want to have your ulnar nerve muscles cold in the wrist, if you're going to, or ulnar nerve muscles in general, even at the elbow, you want to have your median nerve muscles down cold. Uh, you want to have your sensory distribution down cold too, uh, because they actually may ask you like, well, which muscles, Dr. Nuna, are, are and how would you do the exam? And we can't do this in a virtual format, but in, in an examination format, when the world becomes normal again, they may ask, ask you how to examine the, the hand uh, on them, and, and they may get, have to go, may go through that, which is, I think, something very important for everyone to go through. I think in the next coming weeks, I'll do a whole section on peripheral nerve as a review, um, because that examination part portion is important. Actually, if I can just interrupt. Um, yeah, sure. So, so Ravi, um, just to, to add on to that, even if it's a virtual format, um, it's going to be really easy to test whether someone can um, examine a hand, because all you have to do is is pull your thumb towards your nose, um, you know, to test their um, abductor strength. So, um, you know, carpal tunnel, ulnar neuropathy, that's really easy. You, know, you can do a Tunnels over the video really easy. Um, so uh, as Akshar said, you really got to know um, how to test uh, those things pretty, pretty clearly. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think virtual is going to really save us necessarily in terms of examination. Um, this is another thing they will ask you. Also, they can ask you virtually where the, where would you make your incision? But I think they're getting more sophisticated with imaging and where would you put it? And uh, you know, I think you had mentioned this this figure here, uh, top right, uh, when indeed uh, this is the actual correct incision uh, type, distal to the uh, wrist crease uh, into the into the hand. Uh, this incision uh, on the bottom left would get you over the ulnar uh, ulnar artery and ulnar nerve and might might cause damage over the um, hamate bone. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, too big of an incision. Uh, this would uh, lead to um, injury to the recurrent branch, the recurrent thenar branch uh, that arises from the median nerve distally. I think um, at the end of this slide, at the end of all these slides, um, you know, this is basically, they may ask you how to map out an incision. And for carpal tunnel, the classic thing is to, you know, have a line that bisects the um, the hand between the uh, ring and fourth digit. And then this is Kaplan's line. Kaplan's line is from uh, the uh, bony prominence in the, med in, the, in the medial portion of the arm where the ulnar nerve is, all the way to that uh, crease that's in the hand. 
um, and then your incision would be, you know, proximal to that uh, down towards the wrist. So that's the kind of classic landmarks. Any longer of an incision and an incision in the wrong place uh, would lead to damage depending on which quadrant you are. You know, down here in the, in the, in the more, um, you know, uh, where the bony prominence is on the ulnar, uh, ulnar end of the hand, you'll just damage the ulnar artery. Over here, and if the incision is too long, you can get into the recurrent thenar branch that comes off the median nerve and damage that. So that might give you a complication of that. And you definitely do not want to cross the wrist crease, which will cause damage to possibly the tendons uh, of the, uh, the deep tendons, the deep tendons of the hand uh, and forearm. So avoid uh, avoid going to that that distal region. Oh, this is going back to that slide. You know, that tension re free repair with the tenno suture um, and forward. And then the last last case, uh, classic case of subdural hematoma. And your manager was excellent. You know, in terms of like conservative for someone who does not have too many symptoms. Um, the, 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 the treatment of subdural hematomas is so varied and so complicated. I think it boils down to what you're going to do individually in your own practice. Um, if you're going to do burr holes, then argue for burr holes. If you can do a craniotomy, then argue for a craniotomy. The complication is very common and you, deal, you dealt with it appropriately. If you cannot control bleeding during a burr hole procedure, make it into a craniotomy procedure. I don't have a skull with me, um, but they, in the exam, they would have a skull and ask you where you would make your burr holes. And so you want to stick your, make sure your burr holes are in the appropriate positions. Um, typically, two burr holes for a subdural like this, uh, you know, at Coker's point, uh, in the mupillary line, maybe one of the parietal boss, um, but you want to make them, you know, so that you want to be able to have an incision and exposure so you can convert that to a craniotomy pretty quickly. Um, the use of a drain, I think you briefly mentioned it, but uh, classically, there's been only one paper that's proven that, uh, there's only one paper that's been uh, proven to be proven that over and over again, drain, drains are very important for the management of chronic subdural hematomas and reduce the risk of recurrence. And then you're not an endovascular expert, but uh, what's becoming more and more common, as they may ask this for the vascular guys, is the embolization of minimingeal arteries an option as well. And in some places they're doing that. So um, that, uh, you know, that is it. And Robbie, do you have any questions about anything? No. Uh, yeah, you did an excellent job. Got done in a in appropriate time. A few here, a few things here tweaking. Um, right. I don't know if Dr. Monteith you had, had anything to add, but I'll wrap up the session there. Yeah, no, I think I think you did a good job, Robbie. Um, the thing about the the boards, it's kind of a game, and you just have to uh, kind of roll with the punches. You don't know exactly how they're going to play that game, and each examiner is actually quite different. Um, in my uh, experience. Um, I had Dan Barrow for one of my exams and um, we didn't spend too much time on the preamble. We just went straight to the imaging. And so, um, you know, they, they want to know whether you can operate. It's a surgeon's exam. It's not a neurology exam. Obviously you don't want to operate on MS or uh, uh, you know, GBS or something like that, but they want to know what you would do in the OR, uh, how you deal with complications. It's, it's an operative exam. So, you know, you just have to kind of be ready to roll with the punches and and if they throw you a curveball be like okay well that's fine um and the best way you can do that is by practicing uh with multiple uh, different examiners doing exactly what you're doing here um peripheral nerve um you know i tell everyone who um chats to me before they do the exam peripheral nerve and neurology for neurosurgeons are the two chapters in um uh, in uh, the handbook, which are extremely useful. Peripheral nerve gets everyone um, and they can be challenging cases because you're not used to you know, doing those cases, um, knowing how to repair a nerve in, in sort of simple terms, uh, cable graphs or harvesting cerebral nerve to use as a jump graph. Those are kind of like basic things that you'll be expected to know, um, as well as things like Parsonage Turner syndrome, uh, brachial plexopathies, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I'd spend a lot of time revising your stuff that you don't look at very often, which is peripheral nerve. And then the neurology for neurosurgeons in Greenberg is fantastic. And I, I tell people uh, that's the chapter that I read um, sort of two or three times before the exam, because that's the one that, um, you know, you'll screw up. It's uh, doing an ACDF on someone with ALS that that'll you'll fail the boards for that. Uh, biopsying a, a brainstem that has MS, you'll fail the boards for that. So um, 
like Akshay said, if it looks like quarter equiner, it's probably quarter equiner, but you just want to have that kind of gut check before you operate on someone. You have a kind of a little laundry list that you run through, which says, am I about to do something stupid? Uh, no, uh, I'm not about to, you know, biopsy MS and the thoracic cord. Okay, here's the surgery that I do. And, and sometimes obviously it's really easy, like a, a, a subdural, um, but particularly for the spine guys, um, you know, there's a little bit of a kind of a gotcha uh, thing going there, as well as the general neurosurgery section. Um, they want to make sure that you're safe. But I think you did a good job. Um, the incision for uh, the uh, carpal tunnel would, it's not like a fail, but it shows you don't know what you're doing on that operation. So, um, uh, you know, the, those sort of things, the way they score it um, is you kind of get a, a one to four, a three or a four is a pass and a one or a two is a fail. Um, a two is kind of a marginal fail. Uh, a one is this guy is like super dangerous. Four is they're a superstar. And most people get threes um, if they you know are a safe and competent surgeon. And so you don't tend to fail uh, the section uh, unless you get a lot of twos. Um, um, or, uh, you know, a couple of ones. Um, so in general, you just want to kind of hit, you know, hit base hits with threes or maybe the, a couple, a couple of fours, if you really nail the case, but you just want to avoid those kind of, uh, horror moments of, um, you know, biopsying MS or whatever that that'll get you a fail. And then they can recommend failure for that section. And if you fail that section, you'll probably fail the exam. So, um, good job and, and keep practicing. Um, and those are kind of my sort of general pearls. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Monteith. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap up the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nuna, for joining us. And uh, thank you all for joining the session this morning.